Hello and welcome to lecture 15 for the course ECE 257A. Uh, in the model that we have been considering for dependable computing, we are now at the end of the line, which is failures. So part seven of the textbook deals with failures. Uh, today's lecture, lecture 15, covers chapters 25 and 27, uh, dealing with failure confinement, chapter 25, and agreement and adjudication, chapter 27, uh, which contains basically a, a series of strategies for achieving failure confinement. In other words, if one part of the system fails, we want to confine that failure and basically prevent it from spreading to the rest of the system. The last lecture, lecture 16, will be dealing with chapters 26 and 28, failure recovery, chapter 26, and fail-safe system design, chapter 28. And that basically concludes our discussion of dependable computing in this course. Okay, let's now get started with chapter 25, failure confinement. Okay, so the first thing I want to uh, mention is that that failed state, which was at the very bottom of our multi-level model of dependable computing, is really not the last uh, part, the last thing, because a computer system is often, you know, is not does not operate in a vacuum, but is part of a larger system that it helps uh, uh, control or basically compute decisions for that larger system. And therefore, if a computer system fails, often that does not mean that the system in which the computer system is embedded also fails. Uh, and uh, so I've shown here, uh, appended to the bottom of our model after the failed state, two other states, bypassed and disaster, the bypass state is basically when we somehow bypass the computer system. And uh, a prime example of this is when you have manual override for computer system. This is routinely used, for example, in uh, airliners. So an airliner has a computerized control system. However, there is also a manual override for that system which uh, the pilot, an experienced pilot, if uh, he or she notices that something is uh, wrong with the computer or with the decisions, recommendations of the computer, uh, those decisions and recommendations can be overridden and uh, basically manual decisions made. Mm. Of course, we hope that this doesn't happen often because airliners and basically almost all the systems that we use nowadays are very complex. So it's not a trivial matter to control them by hand. But in an emergency, the computer system has failed. The pilots uh, basically have uh, training to be able to take over and manually control the airliner and safely land it uh, <coughs> without any loss of life, okay? So that's the bypass part. And now if we go beyond the bypass part, in other words, that bypassing is ineffective or doesn't solve our problem, then we enter that disaster state. Uh, so there is a buffer between computer failure, failed state, and a disaster, which may lead to loss of life or very major uh, economic damage and stuff like that. And that's the bypass state. 
Okay, and this bypass on manual overwrite is not just for safety critical systems. And here I've cited at the bottom of the slide an example. In 1996, uh, during the Thanksgiving weekend, which is one of the uh, most, uh, one of the busiest uh, travel days, Amtrak's uh, communication systems failed so that the computers at train stations lost access to the centralized database. And it turns out that they didn't have any manual overrides. In other words, without uh, communication access to central computer, they didn't have, they didn't even have information about the price of tickets so that they could at least annually issue tickets to passengers. This created a lot of inconvenience for passengers who were basically stuck at train stations. Uh, without the ability to purchase tickets and uh, travel to the destination, and also a major loss of revenue for Amtrak. So basically, they should have known better that you know the communication system can fail, and therefore they should have had at least some minimal capabilities for issuing tickets manually. In other words, they should have had pricing information printed in books and available at stations so that their operation would not be disrupted because of this. Of course, in some cases, such as e-commerce sites, like if you think of Amazon, the manual systems are infeasible because those sites are built on the assumption that people have access to uh, computers and they can communicate with the uh, servers at the e-commerce site. If that connection is cut for whatever reason, then um, manual operation is basically not an option. But when some, some form of manual operation is an option, that, that provides a buffer between a computer system failing and a disaster, either loss of life or economic uh, disruption uh, happening. Okay, here's another example of the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. Uh, space Shuttle Columbia was uh, the first space shuttle. The second one was Challenger. So it was one of the early uh, space shuttle models. Uh, and this Challenger on its 10th mission on January 28, 1986, exploded 73 seconds after launch, uh, and seven crew members were killed. It was one of the major space uh, disasters uh, in the United States. And the reason for that was that temperature had dipped below freezing on launch day, and engineers were actually concerned. They issued warning that this these below freezing temperatures may cause uh, 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 this part, uh, O-ring, that was used basically to sort of uh, prevent leak of uh, fuel uh, between two parts of the system and uh, basically could malfunction. And for some reason, uh, and the, the investigation that followed basically revealed some major cultural problems at NASA, including ineffective communication channels. So these warnings somehow did not get to the top management. It could have made the decision to scrap the launch and wait for a better, uh, different opportunity to do it. And after that, as a result of the report that the commission investigating the problem issued, they enacted major changes to make sure that something like this, a technical problem that uh, engineers were aware of, 
actually was not ignored and there was effective channels for uh, communicating this information throughout the, the various levels of management. So in this case, uh, uh, there was no option for manual operation, but at the very least, they could have scrapped the launch and waited for a better opportunity uh, where they could uh, launch the space shuttle safely. They could have investigated uh, the O-ring uh, that may have deteriorated as a result of low temperatures and replaced the uh, replace the damaged part with uh, intact new parts and then uh, had the launch uh, a different day where temperatures were more favorable. Okay, so the first thing that we need uh, in order to deal with failures, so basically confine failures, is an awareness of failures. Okay, if you don't know that a particular type of failure can occur, and if you don't have a good estimate for the probability of it occurring, of course, you can't prepare for it. And therefore, when it occurs, it takes you by surprise, and therefore, it will be very difficult to deal with. So it is important to collect experimental failure data. And this has been done... Uh, throughout the computer industry. So I, these lists that you see on this slide are some examples from, uh, many of these are decades old. I'll tell you why these are so old. So for example, uh, the first table that you see on this slide, uh, different systems, Belcor, Tandem. Tandem is a computer company uh, specializing in fault-tolerant computers. Northern Telecom, uh, Japanese commercial computers, so that's a category uh, for which data had been collected, and mainframe users. Uh, the numbers you see are different, but you see that the failures are attributed to hardware causes, software causes, operations, and environment. Okay, for the first uh, system, Belcor. Um, when they collected the data, they did not consider environment as a separate uh, category, so there's no data there. doesn't mean it didn't fail due to environmental conditions, but that data was not collected for it. And then these are average. So you see that the data is all over the place. The different systems are basically exhibit different mixture of causes for failure. But if you take the overall average at the bottom, the red, the line in red, you see that very roughly speaking, you know, something that is easy to remember. About a third of failures are hardware related, hardware causes. About a third of them have software causes. This is very approximate. And about a third are due to operations and environment. So these categories are roughly uh, similar. Um, they have the same importance with regards to uh, causing computer failures. Okay, the second list that you see here, the uh, bottom left of the slide, is for tandem computers, unscheduled outages. Recorded outages and basically attributed each outage to one of these causes, power, communication lines, application software, file system, and hardware. And you see more than half of the unscheduled outages were due to power. So if you know that, if you're aware, so this is failure awareness. If you're aware that this is a ma major cause of computer failures, then you pay more attention to the power supply problem, designing the power supply unit and uh, backup power, stuff like that, that immediately basically reduces your failure rate substantially if you don't have any power problems. 
on the communication lines, application software, file system. Hardware is basically the least problematic item uh, component in this system. And that's in part because these are, you know, fault tolerant, especially designed to be fault tolerant. And therefore, it's not surprising that hardware problems are not a major contributor, contributor to the overall system failure. Okay. But that's because they've, they've specially designed these systems to have fewer hardware problems, that there's redundancy. Okay. Now, for hardware, if you look at the breakdown according to whether it's a disk storage, communications hardware, processors, wiring, spare units, this is a rough distribution. Again, half of the hardware problems are due to disk storage. So this means that in designing dependable computer systems, you have to pay special attention to uh, disk storage and its reliability. So using things like RAID and other re reliable uh, disk storage systems is really, it pays off because it removes or reduces, substantially reduces one of the causes of hardware failures. Okay, spare units, as I mentioned, these tandem computers had spares so that when one unit uh, basically malfunctioned and was removed, you could switch in spares. Uh, spares are basically rarely uh, a cause of uh, hardware failure in the system. So disk storage is the most important, about one half, and about a quarter of the problems comes from communications hardware. So this is basically examples of awareness of failures and their causes being helpful in designing dependable computer systems. Okay, I was going to mention why these are rather old data. Unfortunately, over the years, manufacturers have become reluctant to share failure data as they did uh, maybe three, four decades ago. They were much more open three, four decades ago in sharing failure data so that their customers uh, developed awareness. They knew uh, what possible causes of failures are and could deal with them. Now, the computer industry and generally high-tech industry has become very competitive and manufacturers are much uh, more reluctant to share data openly. In fact, this is not just for failures. Uh, it used to be that, uh, for example, if a new processor was developed, all the details of this processor, internal design algorithms and stuff were published. And one could go to a journal article and find out exactly what they did, you know, how they designed the units and uh, you know, how they measured the performance and so on. Nowadays, as much more uh, what they reveal about their products is much more opaque. Is they don't give you a lot of details. And that's because they are sort of afraid that the ideas will be copied by editors. Uh, that's very unfortunate because, you know, in, 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 at educational institutions, it's very beneficial for us who teach and do research and for our students to learn about all these ideas from the industry. Now, nowadays, they're more likely to protect those ideas with patents um, and therefore not share the details um, so that they can earn money from licensing and also have an edge over competitors in terms of uh, the latest technology. Okay, let's see. Uh, there are um, a bunch of system failure data repositories, uh, and these are two examples. The USENIX Computer Failure Data Repository uh, provided the link here, and also Los Alamos National Laboratory data collected in 1996 and 2005 
from the, the systems, the multiprocessor systems, clusters, and NUMA, non-uniform memory access, uh, parallel computers that they had. And this data, again, the data is old, but it still provides some insight about what causes these high-performance systems to, uh, to fail. There are also um, at least two repositories for memory and storage failure data, and I provided the links here. Uh, uh, for example, for disk memory, uh, observations of uh, many tens or hundreds of thousands of disk memories led to the conclusion that, first of all, the backup curve for failure rate actually applies to disk memories. Because if you remember, I mentioned that this wear out at the end of the backup curve generally does not apply to electronics because electronics do not experience wear out. Disk memories do experience wear out because they have a lot of mechanical parts. Of course, the solid state disks are a, a different story. But this, this is basically magnetic rotating disk where there are a lot of mechanical parts. Okay, so what this curve shows based on the data, observation data, is that there is the infant mortality, high failure rate, up to about a year. Okay, this is a very rough indication. About a year, the first year of a disk memory's life, failure rate is rather high. So if you want to provide disk memories for uh, dependable uh, computer installation, you may want to actually not use disk memories in the first year of life. Wait until this first year has passed and then start using here, where there is a fairly low constant, roughly constant failure rate. Then around five to seven years after the beginning of the life of the disk, the wear out period starts. Okay, and the lesson that this teaches us is that we should be proactive. In other words, don't wait for disks to fail. After maybe five years, just replace the disk. You know, it's, uh, of course, it costs money to replace it, but that money is well spent because it reduces the probability of data loss during the disk crash. Of course, if you have RAID, uh, you can tolerate uh, a small number of disk crashes. So for example, with parity, one disk crash will not cause a problem. But the second disk crash can, can lead to data loss. Therefore, it's basically um, companies, organizations that operate uh, large storage systems with many thousands or tens of thousands of disk units, put it into their practice to replace disks before they actually are worn out and start failing. Okay, uh, they can still fail here. It doesn't mean that they won't fail, but it's much less likely for a disk memory to fail in this region than after wear out. Okay. Uh, for software, again, uh, I found these uh, repositories years ago. Unfortunately, the second one of these, which was the more interesting one, has become defunct. Basically, supplied the list of software project failures and uh, basically describe the project, what the software did, and the causes of failures. Okay, now, uh, the reason that this went defunct, it's no longer accessible, it was not made clear, but one can easily guess that, first of all, such information is very valuable, maybe they decided they didn't want to provide that information free of charge. So 
Maybe there are some other companies providing that at a cost. The second reason, perhaps more important, is that uh, describing these projects and their failures is sort of embarrassing to the companies and organizations that sort of implemented these projects. And therefore, there may have been the question of legal liability that uh, you know they could be sued for exposing these weaknesses of various companies and organizations in their uh, software projects. Anyway, it's not accessible. Again, a shame because it was very useful. I remember I spent sometimes hours going through these projects, reading about them, causes of failures, and I learned a lot from the information on that site. Okay, one of the, of course, having failure data, awareness of failure is important in and of itself, but it also helps us to validate or tune models. And here I have a very uh, interesting example. Uh, suppose um, I have a two-disk system, like the mirror disk. There's a main disk and there's a mirror disk. And this two-disk system, uh, initially both disks are operating, so this is the model. Then one disk uh, fails or crashes, and then you have just one disk, but you still have your data. And then if before the failed disk is repaired or is, is replaced with a new disk, uh, a second failure occurs and the system fails. So this is a system failure state. This is full function. And this is a state in which the data is still available on one of the disks. Okay? So it's easy to, when you analyze this model, uh, you find that the disk pair failure rate the effective failure rate is approximately 2 lambda squared over mu. <laughs> Remember, lambda is a disk, failure rate for a disk. So the reason we have 2 lambda here is that two disks are operating. Mu is the repair rate for that disk that failed. And 2 lambda squared over mu, remember that lambda is a very small number. Mu is also a small number, but it's more, much larger than lambda. So if you compare this with lambda, which is if you had just one disk, the failure rate would be lambda. Uh, two lambda squared over mu is much less than lambda. So the disk pair failure rate is a much smaller number than lambda. Okay. The disk pair mean time to failure is the inverse of that failure rate. And then if you accept the manufacturer's claim that the mean time to failure is 50,000 hours or 5.7 years, the mean time to repair is 5 hours, okay? So mu is 5 hours. Okay, 1 over lambda, which is mean time to failure for a single disk, is 50,000 hours. If you plug into that equation, you get 28,500 years. In other words, if this model is correct, and if the manufacturers claim that the disk MTTF is 50,000 hours, and repair being five hours is reasonable, that's basically the data reconstruction time. So it's unlikely that uh, this is the source of the problem. Anyway, now, in 48,000 years of observation, of course, nobody can observe systems for 48,000 years. This is effective 48,000 years because they observed 6,000 systems, each of which had four disk pairs, okay, for two years. So effectively, they made 48,000 years of observation for single disk pairs, okay? They observed 35 double disk failures. So this basically, they recorded failures and there were 35 double disk failures. This translates to a mean time to failure of 1400 years, okay? Which is much smaller 
and what this model suggested. So something is wrong here. Either our model is not accurate, we need to change our model. This claim of 50,000 hours MTTF is incorrect. So now having this data allows us to go back and validate. In this case, we don't validate this because it's uh, obviously invalid because the model, uh, model result is much different from the actual observed outcome. Okay, so we can go back and say, okay, maybe we need a transition from the state two to state zero. We need to augment this model with the transition here because it's possible that a single disk failure actually disables the system because we can't recover from it. We don't detect it, for example. Okay, so basically we have to change the model. We also have to double check this to make sure that this claim is correct. Now, experimental failure data is difficult to correct, collect. In this case, we were lucky that there were so many, such a large number of systems that we could observe for two years and get pretty good data. Imagine if we have a one-of-a-kind system, the type of computers, for example, that NASA designs and built, uh, they have a very small number of copies, maybe less than a dozen of those computers are ever built. So we don't have thousands of systems to observe over a limited amount of time and get uh, acceptable failure data. Uh, and there are also psychological results. For example, logs may not be complete or accurate because especially failures that uh, are caused by incorrect operation, incom incompetent uh, operators, because those are very embarrassing for the operators and for the companies who employ them. Uh, sometimes that embarrassment factor leads them to underreport failures. Uh, assigning a cause to each failure is not an easy task. It takes a lot of work, a lot of investigation to see exactly what caused any particular failure. Uh, even when data is actually collected by vendors and the manufacturers of computer systems, they may not be willing to share the data. This is something I referred to earlier, but they do have data internally in the company, they may not be willing to share that data with customers and with the research community. And I already mentioned that this is impossible to do for one of a kind or very limited systems. Okay, now one, once we have a good idea of failures and their likelihood probabilities, we have to do what is known as risk assessment. And we have talked about this before, that the risk is basically the product of two factors, the frequency of events that create those risks times the magnitude or consequence of those events. So for example, in the case of an airliner, the event may be airliner crash magnitude can be loss of life from the point of view of FAA or monetary damages that an airline company has to pay from the viewpoint of the airline company. Of course, there are also uh, intangible consequences uh, like the reputation of the airline being damaged as a result of too many crashes but those can also be translated into monetary damages. You know, if the reputation uh, is tarnished, then maybe fewer passengers will travel with that airline, or they have to discount their tickets or whatever. So, uh, okay, so frequency is basically unreliability or failure probability. So for example, 
a crash happens once every 100,000 flights, okay? So there's, that's the unreliability. Magnitude is estimated through economic analysis. Sometimes there is a direct economic consequence. And sometimes we have to translate other consequences to uh, numbers, economic uh, indicators. And a uh, prime example among those is loss of life. Again, taking the airliner example, if uh, passengers die, then the airline company must must give provide damages, pay damages. Uh, typically, this happens by a settlement with the representatives of families who lost people. Anyway, for this, they have to have an idea of how much, basically, how much is a life worth? How much money do you have to pay if you cause, you know, somebody to die. Okay, so here is a, a thought experiment. So suppose you are told that you have a 1 in 10,000 chance of dying today. That's a small chance, but still, you know, it's, it's not completely negligible. How much would you be willing to pay to buy out this risk? Suppose you could pay some sum of money, some amount of money, to eliminate that risk. How much are you willing to pay? This is basically how insurance works, because insurance companies have an idea about the risk of some event occurring, and then they know how much they have to pay if that event occurs. So the premium is computed based on uh, similar considerations. Okay, so if your answer is, this is a hard question to answer, if you have not thought about it before, suppose you say, okay, I'm willing to pay $1,000. What does that mean? That means that your life is worth to you about $10 million, $1,000 for 1 in 10,000 chance. So 1,000 times 10,000 is 10 million. So if you consider your life worth 10 million, you're willing to pay a thousand dollars to buy out this risk, in other words, eliminate that risk. Okay, you can read the rest of the slide on your own. Now, risks typically, especially serious risks, have are associated with fairly small probabilities, like an airliner crashing has a tiny probabilities. And human beings, unfortunately, are not very good in estimating and interpreting very small probabilities. So here are some numbers. These are not, you know, if you look at different, different references, different sources, you may get different numbers. But basically, here I'm trying to convey to you that the risk of dying from flu one in 5,000 is greater than risk of dying because of being struck by an auto, a tornado in the U.S. Midwest, earthquake in California, nuclear power plant accident, meteorite. So these are really tiny risks at the bottom here. Yet people tend to be, let's, let's take an earthquake. People tend to be a lot more scared uh, of earthquakes than of, let's say, being struck by an auto. And the reason is psychological, because when a risk is familiar, in other words, you see autos every day, you drive an auto probably daily, so that's, that's a familiar thing to you. And when something is familiar, your job may have some risks associated with it if you're a firefighter. 
But when you're familiar with the risk or the setting where the risk is created, you can tolerate higher risk. Something is a mystery to you. So earthquake, maybe you have never experienced a major earthquake that causes uh, serious damage. It's more scary. Okay, so uh, here are some more data in this table. I'm going to skip this table. But these are interesting, you know, make sure to look at these and sort of try to learn from them. Uh, U.S. causes of death per million people. Okay, this is, these are annual data. Auto accident, 210. Work accident, 150. So those are the top of the list. Homicide, everybody is scared of being killed. That's a much smaller risk, being killed by uh, uh, maybe a criminal. Uh, aviation, okay, uh, going on a flight, airplane. The risk is very small compared to these at the top, but people are more scared more people are scared of, you know, flying than of driving. Again, familiarity. Also, in aviation, sometimes when a plane crashes, uh, perhaps hundreds of people die. And accidents where there are a large number of victims at once tend to be more dramatic and more scary to people. And an auto accident that typically, you know, uh, either does not kill anybody or uh, maybe one or two. Okay. So risk underestimation factors of familiarity being part of our job. Remoteness in time or space. So for example, if a tsunami occurs in Asia and we are here in the United States, that distance makes it less scary and therefore we tend to underestimate the risk or the damage. Uh, overestimation factors include scale, for example, an event that kills thousands of people, like the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks in the U.S., and proximity. If some disaster happens uh, in a nearby community, we tend to uh, put more uh, importance consider more important and therefore overestimate the risk. Okay. Now, to limit the damage from uh, failures, prompt failure detection is perhaps the most important uh, prerequisite. The sooner you find out that something has failed, the less likely it is to cause major problems. So uh, prompt failure detection is very important. Okay, in, uh, in many cases, uh, like when dealing with mechanical elements, such as wing flaps in an airplane, a reaction time of tens of seconds or hundreds of seconds, hundreds of milliseconds uh, is adequate because mechanical systems have inertia. Therefore, you have, you have time to basically detect the failure. Whereas in some other cases, uh, you may not have that much time and you need very quick failure detection, electronic systems, for example. So here you see the result of an experimental study in which the probability of data loss in disk systems is plotted against uh, detection latency in minutes. So if you detect uh, problems, let's say, in 10 minutes, the probability of data loss is much smaller, especially, so these are different uh, redundancy group sizes, but the shape of all the curves is basically increasing. So probability of data loss increases 
significantly with the detection latency. So if the detection latency is 60 minutes, uh, then probability of data loss, let's take this, this curve, is around maybe 15%, whereas if it's only 10 minutes, it's 5%. So quick failure detection reduces the probability of data loss in disk memory and more generally in any system. Prompt failure detection is very important. Okay, another strategy for dealing with failures is basically try to avoid them as much as you can. And there are various strategies for failure avoidance, basically designing systems so that they are less likely to fail to begin with, so that we don't have to worry about uh, detecting failures and dealing with them. So these are some key uh, recommendations or advice for uh, designing dependable systems, okay? Limit novelty. In other words, stick with proven methods and technologies. If you want your system to be highly dependable, don't try to use the latest technology and the latest fad in design methods and uh, basically operations and features. Uh, limit novelty, use proven methods and technologies. Adopt sweeping simplifications. And very early in the course, I mentioned that simplification, when we talked about the uh, reliability equation being e to the minus n lambda t. Lambda is a failure rate, t is time, n is the number of components in your system. Fewer components you have, okay, the more reliable the system becomes, the less likely for it to fail. So as much as possible, simplify the system. Okay, don't put any uh, bells and whistles or unneeded features in the system because each additional feature um, can create you know, new points of failure. So Try to avoid putting too many features if they're not absolutely needed. Get something simple working soon. In other words, don't try to design the whole system at once. Uh, design a simpler version of the system, a prototype, and make it work. And then iteratively add capabilities. So those capabilities that you did not put in the simple system, add them gradually, one at a time, and then test the system after each capability is added so that incrementally you develop your system and uh, introduce dependability in its operation. Give incentives for reporting errors, okay? Uh, the team that works on the design should be incentivized so that they report errors thoroughly and quickly. So like rewards and bonuses for each error that is found or reported. Uh, D-scope is basically the same as uh, simplification. Reduce goals and specs early on. A lot of times people start working on a project that is very ambitious. And then near the end, they, they think, oh, that was too ambitious. Maybe we can't finish this. A product on budget or on time, or even um, make it work. Okay, so at the end they just reduced uh, the scope of the system. Try to do this early on before you put in too much time and effort into the system. Remove stuff from the system that you no know, are, are not absolutely needed. Give control to and keep it in a small design team. Okay, one of the causes of undependability, lack of dependability, is huge design teams with ineffective communication between members of the team. Typically, small design teams tend to be more efficient and uh, better in terms of internal communication. So keep the design team 
small, as small as possible. And finally, the last uh, part of this uh, chapter, ethical considerations, uh, is another case of Remember, early in the course, I mentioned that we really should not need a course on dependable computing because other courses where you learn to design things, whether software or hardware, should incorporate all these dependability techniques in them. Unfortunately, ethics is also treated in the same way in the sense that we basically don't talk about ethics in most of our courses. And then there is, in our undergraduate curriculum, we have an ethics course that students take sort of as if it's a, it's a separate thing. And people sometimes don't even pay much attention to that course, just a required course that they have to complete and pass. Whereas it should be an integral part, an in uh, graduate a graduate program, we don't even have an ethics course. Okay, so this is something that, as computing professionals, or basically in any technology, but especially in computing, you should be aware of. Now, in computing, there are two main societies IEEE and ACM, Association for Computing Machinery, they have code of ethics. So when you become members of these societies, you are essentially uh, implicitly agreeing to follow uh, the code of ethics. Uh, so I've uh, listed here a few key points from IEEE's code of ethics, items 1, 6, and 7. Uh, accept responsibility in making decisions consistent with the safety, health, and welfare of the public to disclose promptly factors that might, en might endanger the public or the environment. So as a computing professional, you should adhere to this principle. Maintain and improve our technological competence and to undertake technological tasks for others only if qualified by training or experience. In other words, never accept to work on a system for which you feel you are not qualified. You don't know enough to design a safe uh, system that does not threaten the welfare of the users. And number seven, seek, accept, and offer honest criticism of technical work uh, to acknowledge and correct errors and to credit properly the contribution of others. If you see that something is wrong with the system and that it may endanger people's life or will cause economic damage, you should speak up as a computing professional. And these are not easy things to do. Uh, sometimes people have uh, to pay a price for criticizing or uh, raising a point that will cause a product not to be developed or to be delayed the development to be delayed and therefore the company might suffer some economic uh, losses but that's our professional responsibility to, to do it acm is similar so acm as part of the code of ethics says that we should minimize malfunctions by following generally accepted standards for system design and testing and give comprehensive and thorough evaluations of computer systems and their impact, including analysis of possible risks. Okay, so these are the two professional societies most directly related to uh, computing, hardware and software. There's also a National Society of Professional Engineers that has its own code of conduct. The principles are the same in all of these. Uh, the wording may be different, the emphasis may be different, but it's the same principle. Okay. So this completes chapter 25. Let me now go to chapter 27, uh, dealing with agreement and adjudication.
this is a very important topic. Um, and in fact, it's an area uh, that I have done research myself. So uh, my discussion of this topic is probably more comprehensive than what you see in other books of dependable computing because of my own investment of time and effort to, to study these problems. Okay, so the first idea is voting. We have already talked about voting. Now, in my research on voting, I came across similar concepts in context outside dependable. So dependable computing research, of course, relies on voting, the way we have discussed before, TMR, NMR, and so on. But there's also a field called data fusion, where various, let's say, sensors collect data. And then there's a fuser here that gets these various pieces of data and sort of draws conclusions about what is being observed based on these various uh, sensor uh, outputs. There's also a field within uh, sociology called social choice research uh, that deals with similar concepts. So an example of social choice uh, is, of course, elections. Where people vote for candidates and then the candidate is selected. But there are more complicated versions of that, too. So if you want to have a party and uh, you're trying to decide, you know, what drinks to serve, you may sort of ask the opinions of uh, the participants, and based on the input you receive from those participants, decide, you know, what set of drinks to serve. So all of these are faced with similar problems. So the first thing I did in this area of research is to so that we improve the terminology so that when we talk about these methods, they can apply to these. So and the problem is that in, say, election, political elections, we talk about voters. There are voters here. And they sort of offer their votes. And then the fuser basically uh, extracts information about who was elected. Things like runoffs, there are a lot of complications there. But in the simplest case, people vote. They're, they're called voters. And then their votes is offered here, and the fuser determines the election outcome. Now, notice that here we talk about voters as these people who cast votes. In the context of dependable computing, we call this voter. Okay, so this, this creates problems. If you want to talk about all of these ideas, uh, the terminology cannot be ambiguous. So in one case, you call these voters. In one case, you call this voter. Okay, so here is a uniform terminology. We have participants. So the black terms that you see are the uniform terminology that you can use. The participants present opinions. And these opinions can have weight. So, you know, one participant's opinion may carry a higher weight than another one. Those are weighted voting voting schemes. And then this is fuser. So we don't use voter here, fuser. So participants offer opinions. The opinions may have weights. They may not be equal. And then the fuser basically takes the opinions and their weights and generates the outcome of this process. So this is basically data fusion of various kinds. We have multiple data sources, and we fuse the data from those sources, whether they're opinions or whatever, into an outcome. Okay, so here is why voting or data fusion in our new terminology is important.
Suppose we use radar image analysis to classify approaching aircraft uh, as being a civilian, a fighter jet, or a bomber. Okay, so basically uh, fighters and bombers uh, present threats. Okay, so you're sitting at a military base. You want to know if a fighter jet approaching or a bomber jet approaching or it's just a civilian. So the, there's no threat from a civilian airliner, but these are threats. And the level of threat is different. A fighter jet can do less damage than a bomber. So you want to be able to tell whether an aircraft is one of these. Okay, so the image analysis, uh, so in order to make this determination reliably, let's say you use three different units with different algorithms, different hardware perhaps, and two of them render the opinion, render the judgment that what is approaching is a fighter jet, and one of them says it's a bomber, okay? because we can't be sure and different algorithms can lead to different outcomes. So in this case, majority of these image classifiers, image analyzers, say that we are dealing with a fighter jet. Okay? <clears throat> so this is an instance where we have to sort of take these opinions and come up with an outcome. The outcome will be very likely it's a fighter jet, but we don't know. Uh, we can't rule out the possibility that it's a bomber. Okay, so maybe one of these made a mistake, and there should have been one, two, two instead of one, one, two. Okay, so in this case, we can use majority. That's the simplest kind of data fusion or voting is majority, okay? Now suppose uh, we also have sensors that uh, determine the distance, okay? The an airplane is coming, uh, how far is it from us? And let's say our three systems, uh, sensors, offer these opinions, 12 and a half miles, 12.6 miles, 14 miles. Now here there's no majority, so simple majority cannot be used here because no number has majority among these three. There could have been five of these, okay? But there's no majority. But you can say that two of them are almost, almost in agreement that the distance is about 12.5 or 12.6. One of them is not in agreement, although you know it's not the opinion of this third one is not too far from the other ones. But it's possible that it's malfunctioning and it's giving us the incorrect number. So this is basically an approximate type of data fusion or voting. Uh, we deal with not exact numbers but approximate numbers. Okay, so majority voting or majority fusion, here's an example. Uh, the opinions are 1, 2, 3, 2, 2. And the majority of these five opinions indicate that 2 should be the outcome. Okay, now majority fusers can be built from comparators and multiplexers. Okay, so here's an example. This is three input majority fuser. Uh, basically, we have just one comparator comparing X1 and X2. If the two agree, in other words, X1 is equal to X2. Agree, I mean they're either equal or agree in the sense here, in the sense, oops, here, for example, we can say this 12.5 and 12.6 are in agreement. So sort of approximate agreement can also be considered. 
<clears throat> okay, so these two are compares, and if they agree, in other words, if this signal is zero, if the disagree signal is zero, then is x2 sent to the output. These two agree, so one of them is sent to the output. If they disagree, <coughs> excuse me, they disagree, then this third input will be sent to the output. The idea being that if these two disagree, and if we do have a majority, then one of them must agree with this third one. And therefore, without further comparisons, we just send this to the output. So this is a very simple three input fuser, majority fuser, or voter in our old term terminology consisting of a comparator and a multiplexer. Okay, we can also have weighted voting or weighted fusing uh, where we have x1, x2, xn are the input values, the opinions, each of them has a weight, B1, B2, Bn, those are the weights. And those weights can be integers or they can be real numbers. For example, we can say, okay, in, within some organization where we are doing voting, this particular person, because he or she is an expert in the domain that we are discussing, give that person maybe two votes. So the weight will be two, whereas the other ones have one. So more generally, the weights can be different for different participants. And then we determine an output and its corresponding weight. Okay, let's say all these V1, V2, Vn add up to capital V. So that's the some total of all the weights, okay? If we require that this output weight be V, this is unanimity. It's a kind of voting that basically is not really voting. They, all of these must agree in order for us to produce that agreed upon value as output. And the weight of that output will be the sum of all these weights, okay? That's unanimity voting. Majority voting requires that the output weight be greater than the sum of the... So remember, this is weighted. So if all the weights are equal to 1, this basically says that more than half of the inputs should agree. But if inputs have different weights, then we deal with weights. The weight of the output should be greater than half of the total weights that we have. And this is known as supermajority, greater than or equal to two thirds of votes. And this is Byzantine, strictly greater than two V over three. Uh, plurality is basically when uh, some output is produced so that the weight associated with that output is greater than the weight associated with any other output. So we don't need majority. So maybe only two of these agree, but nothing else agrees with anything else. So that's plurality, meaning that Two is the maximum that maximum agreement that we have here. This is like when you have a political election with maybe ten candidates, and they each get a number of votes. Maybe the top candidate, uh, let's say, a thousand people vote. The top candidate get maybe fifty votes. Uh, the second candidate gets forty votes, and the other ones get the uh, fewer votes. The so plurality voting in this case, the top vote together will be selected. And then threshold voting is when we require this weight to exceed some preset lower bound. So for example, 
let's say all the weights are equal and let's say there are seven inputs so if we say threshold voting three out of seven if three out of seven agree then we produce that out that, that's a threshold that we set okay I'm gonna go faster through uh, there are a lot of slides in this chapter and there are interesting topics but we really don't have enough time to cover everything in great detail okay so there's an example of plurality voting so the five inputs presented to the plurality fuser are one three two three four three there are two opinions that are equal to three and opinions one two and four they're single uh, single units and therefore plurality of inputs indicate that the output should be three okay again this is when the numbers are exact the numbers are like this uh, 1 3.99 3 1.01 what should the output be okay if you take this view over here 3 the value 3 constitutes two of the opinions whereas the other three are single opinions they're all different from each other on the other hand if these are approximate values you can argue that three of the opinions are roughly equal to one one this is a little bit less than one this is a little bit greater than one so perhaps one would be the correct output so these are the fine points that I mentioned you know this is a pretty broad uh, an important research area when you uh, dig deeper and consider all these special cases now median voting is one way to deal with approximate values so if I take these five values what is the median of these values okay median basically takes there are five of them By the way the two largest which are these two Put away the two smallest, 99 and 1, and then this emerges at the median. Okay, when there is majority, then the median always identifies the majority. So the nice thing about median is that if there's no majority, it still gives you a reasonable value. If there is a majority, let's go back to one of the examples that we had, like here majority does exist if you compute the median basically it says put away the two largest let's say this three and this two put away the two smallest this one and this two and two emerges at the as the outcome and therefore when there is majority it does give you the majority okay so this is uh, from an old paper of mine uh, how do you design weighted voters because it's not immediately obvious how you implement a weighted voter because uh, or weighted fuser let me go back okay if all the weights are equal to one I mentioned that you can do comparisons and multiplexers but if these weights are arbitrary numbers real or integers then it's not trivial to find what value has the largest okay so here is a general design strategy if you have a bunch of opinions five four five seven four each with an associated weight one two three two one so here I've chosen integer weights but they don't have to be integer there's a three phase uh, circuit that can basically find the result of weighted uh, fusion of these inputs first sort by data so the data is the first item here the weight is the second sort by data so the seven which is the largest goes on top then the two fives doesn't matter which, which order and then the two fours 
So sort by date. Now in phase two, you design a circuit to combine weights of equal values. Now because equal values are adjacent to each other, you can easily design a circuit to combine the votes. So seven is alone, so it just goes to the output. Uh, the two fives are combined by adding their weights and a dummy entry here is created because the number should always be five. So this is basically the combination of these two entries. And this is a dummy entry. Similarly here, four and three and a dummy entry. And then select the maximum weight. So look among the weights and somehow select the maximum. The maximum happens to be four in this example. So five, four is chosen as the output. This means that among these inputs, five prevails because it has the largest possible support or weight, which is four. Okay, you see that uh, seven has only a support of two and four has a support of three. So that's the correct choice. And I won't go through this. Um, you can look through it if you are interested to see how these things are designed. Sorting networks are well known. And in fact, in my course on parallel processing, which will be offered in winter, we talk in detail about how to design sorting networks. So that part is already well known. And this is a combining network. So these are basically combiners. You compare these two. If their uh, data are identical, you combine the votes. So here in this case, uh, this is, uh, let me see. Uh, so here's seven, two, Okay, this comparator, five and four, remember this is the sorting part. So five goes on top and four at the bottom. So no change occurs. And then this comparator, uh, seven is larger, so it goes to the top, five goes to the bottom. And this comparator now compares seven, two, with 5, 1, so 7 goes at the top, 5 goes here, and so on and so forth. Okay, and this is the combining network, and this is the selector. The selector is the easiest part because it's basically a maximum finding task uh, that can be done. So this basically means of these two, compare the weights and put the larger one there. Of these two, compare the weights and put the larger one there, and so on. Okay, one way to generalize this kind of weighted voting or weighted fusion uh, schemes is called the agreement or quorum sets. Okay, so for example, if I list this set as the quorum set, this means if x1 and x2 agree, then they determine the output. If x2 and x3 agree, then that those two determine the output. If x3 and x1 agree, then those two. This is basically two out of three majority. Any two that agree, the output will be based on those two. Okay? Here's another example. Uh, if x1 and x2 agree, then they determine the output. If x1, x3, and x4 agree, they determine the output. If x2, x3, and x4 agree, so this is basically a quorum set. If you have this quorum, this agreement, then they determine the output. Now, this is uh, basically, we are giving x1 and x2 more importance in this scheme. Because if x1 and x2 agree with each other, they determine the output. If they disagree, then x1 must agree with two other 
participants or extremists agree with two other participants. Now it so happens that I can convert this to weighted fusion, weighted voting. All I need to do is to give a weight of 2 to x1 and x2 and a weight of 1 to x3 and x4 and choose a threshold of 4. Okay, so 2 plus 2 equals or exceed the threshold. 2 plus 1 plus 1 equals or exceeds the threshold. 2 plus 1 plus 1. Uh, we also must make sure that no other combination, because when we say these are the agreement or quorum sets, means that there are no other sets. I've listed all of the quorum sets. Okay, so not only we should have we should assign weights so that within these quorums we can equal or exceed the threshold. We should make sure that another, like x3, x4, does not have enough weight. Okay? So it's, it's kind of tricky. But it turns out that this scheme is more general. In fact, one of the problems at the end of the chapter basically asks you to come up with quorum sets that cannot be implemented, that are not equivalent. This particular quorum set was equivalent to weighted threshold uh, fusion. Okay, but you can come up with sets, quorum sets, that are not implementable as weighted uh, threshold fusion. Okay. As I mentioned, I'm not going to discuss all the details here. So sometimes weighted threshold fusion can be, especially when the weights are integers, can be converted to unweighted fusion. So in this case, for example, when the weights of x1 and x2 are 2, the weights of x3 and x4 are equal to 1, you can basically duplicate x1 and x2 and just do a straight unweighted fusion. Okay, so when the weights are small integers, then this works well. Um, in other cases, you can do a bunch of comparisons, and I leave it up to you to study this table. A bunch of comparisons and selections, multiplexers to implement the voting scheme. Okay, uh, agreement sets we already talked about. I'm going to skip this slide. Okay, when I started looking at the literature and social choice, I came across something called Eros theorem. Uh, it's basically an impossibility or incompleteness result. Eros theorem says no voting scheme exists that satisfies all four desirable conditions for voting systems that are enumerated over here. And the four desirable, this is uh, for political or social choice uh, voting. There should be no big brother. In other words, participants are free to express preferences. It's obviously a desirable attribute. Independence of irrelevant alternatives. This is a fancy way of saying that preference for one candidate over another is independent of all other candidates. In other words, if I say I like candidate A better than candidate B, that should not depend on which other candidates are running. Okay, in other words, I say candidate A is better, is a better candidate than B. And whether C, D, E, and F are running, that should not uh, basically invalidate this preference. That's a reasonable thing to require. Every outcome should be possible. In other words, uh, beforehand, we should not be able to rule out anybody from being elected. That's also, you know, if ahead of time you, you set the voting rules so that some people can never be elected, that's obviously undesirable. 
And there should be no dictatorship or anti-dictatorship. Dictatorship means that outcome is always conforming to the view of one person as dictator. Anti-dictatorship is just the opposite. The outcome is always in disagreement with the view of a particular person. Okay, and Arrow's theorem basically says you cannot satisfy all four of these conditions in any, no matter how elaborate your voting scheme, you, you can always come up with counter examples uh, that says, you know, one, at least one of these uh, desirable uh, properties, attributes, uh, will be violated. Okay, I won't go into the details. It's a very interesting discussion. It's probably not very relevant to dependable computing, at least at this point, because we are not dealing with a large number of options and all these complications, but someday it may become relevant. At this point, I just wanted you to be aware of this impossibility result for perfect voting. Okay, approximate voting, some examples on this slide. Please study it on your own. I won't go through the details. Uh, there is a voting scheme called approval voting in which instead of a person selecting just one candidate, you can vote for any number of candidates. Basically, you divide the candidates. Let's say there are four candidates, A, B, C, D. This is a voter, a participant, and this participant says A, B, or C, they're all acceptable from my viewpoint. D obviously isn't. Okay? And similarly, the other voters, the other participants, and then you just tally the votes and say this one gets nine, this one gets nine, this one gets nine, this last one gets four. Okay? This happens in political elections, for example, when three candidates are more or less similar and the fourth candidate is different. So when these three candidates are very similar and you force people to just vote for one person, okay, the votes will be divided among these. So this one votes for A, this one may vote for B, this one may vote for C. So if, let's say, that division is completely symmetric, then each of these will get three votes. Three, 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 and this this last candidate will win the election because he or she got four votes. So um, this approval voting avoids this kind of danger of multiple similar candidates splitting the votes and therefore perhaps a less desirable or less qualified candidate winning the election. So there are all sorts of different voting schemes. Uh, this one I'm going to skip so that I can get to this idea of Byzantine failures and distributed voting. This is the last topic that I'm going to discuss. So let's say we have three, uh, let's just talk about temperature sensors. Three temperature sensors sense the temperature of a particular device or site, and then they present the temperature to these processing nodes that do the fusion. Okay. Now let's say this sensor is malfunctioning in such a way, not only it gets the wrong wrong uh, temperature, but also it's inconsistent. In other words, it communicates to this processor temperature of 105, uh, 121 to this one, 158. So it's completely unreliable. It basically, so it may be doing this on purpose. Maybe this is a hacked, hacked system that the hacker is trying to confuse the system by producing these uh, inconsistent result. So if the processing units basically use the median rule, this one will come up with 120, 
This one will come up with 121. So they get different results. Okay? And the problem may get worse if you have more units and more of these uh, Byzantine uh, malfunctions in your sensor. So this is an area that is studied in distributed systems. So let me just go to this uh, Byzantine generals problem. You may have seen this in other courses, especially if you have taken a distributed systems course. So remember we talked about the two generals problem, two generals paradox. Uh, this is in a way similar. Uh, we have three generals, one commanding general and two lieutenant generals. And they want to sort of come up with an agreed upon a time to attack the enemy territory. And we want them to all come up with the same decision in order to maximize the chance of being able to defeat the enemy. Again, as before, they can send uh, messengers to communicate with each other. Now the twist here, the additional twist, is that let's say one of these three can be a traitor. Okay, so the commanding general can be a traitor or lieutenant one, let's say one at most one, or lieutenant two. And a traitor can try to confuse things and cause basically lack of agreement so that uh, an attack, for example, L1 attacks, G attacks, but L2 does not attack. So leads to defeat for the forces of these three generals. Okay? Now it turns out that if you have three generals and one of them is a traitor, even though a majority of the generals are loyal, you cannot reach an agreement uh, that is foolproof, okay? So this is where majority uh, of the generals being loyal is not sufficient. So let's see why. Here is a situation where the commanding general issues the attack command and Let's say, uh, you know, communication is reliable. You know, it makes it even harder if the communication is not. So, in other words, this general sends a messenger to, the two, to each of the two generals and say, attack at a certain time. Okay. So, both of these lieutenant generals receive the attack command. And, however, this lieutenant general sitting here, which receives the attack command, because he cannot be sure that the general sending this command is a loyal general. Remember, we said it can be one traitor. He cannot trust that command. So what should we do? Well, maybe these two lieutenants can exchange information. So the general said attack to both of them. This one receives an attack here. This is a traitor. So the traitor tries to confuse things and then informs L1 that the general said, retreat, do not attack. So this general sitting here receives a direct attack command from the commanding general, receives an indirect retreat command from the other lieutenant and therefore does not do, does not know what to do, especially since if this general happens to be a traitor, this situation is indistinguishable. These two situations are distinguished because this traitor commanding general can say attack this general and retreat to this one. Remember, a traitor tries to confuse things. And then this one being loyal, directly relays the information it says the general told me to retreat. So attack, retreat, completely identical to this situation. So Lieutenant 1 now does not know whether the commanding general is a traitor, in which case he should not follow the command, or Lieutenant 2 is a traitor, 
in which case he should follow the command of the general. Okay. It turns out that if you have F Byzantine failures, you need at least three F plus one nodes to reach agreement. Remember, majority says with F failures, you need 2F plus 1. Okay, because if there are F faulty nodes and you have 2F plus 1, then the majority of the nodes are good. But in this case, you need more, a lot more, 3F plus 1. So you need at least four generals in order to be able to tolerate one trader or one in the case of if this is a computer network, one Byzantine node failure. Byzantine means the node is completely is behaving completely arbitrarily, and therefore you cannot trust anything coming from that node. So you need four, and this example shows that four is enough. And uh, so to tolerate F Byzantine failures, you need 3F plus 1 or more fault containment regions. Those are basically the nodes that we are uh, using, and we want to contain the fault within those nodes. Uh, the fault containment regions or the nodes must be interconnected via at least 2F plus 1 disjoint paths. And inputs must be exchanged in at least F plus 1 rounds. Okay, so I won't go through the details of proving these, but let me go back to here. <clears throat> so if I want to tolerate one Byzantine uh, failure. I need at least four nodes, so this is not enough. It does have the second conditions that there are two connecting paths. So from G to L, this is one connecting path. This is the second connecting path. But this one satisfies both of those conditions, therefore this is enough. So to reiterate, we need 3F plus 1 or more fault containment regions. And these fault containment regions must be interconnected via at least 2F plus 1 disjoint paths. So for F equal to 1, there should be 3. Uh, I made a mistake when I said that that opting. So this one does not have the second condition either. They're not, they're not 3 paths. But here, there are three paths. So here's one path from G to L1. Here is a second path. Here is a third path. So it does satisfy that necessary condition. OK, so let me stop at this point. And uh, next lecture, we will cover uh, chapters 26 and 28. And a little bit from the appendix that uh, it's sort of like a separate chapter dealing with some miscellaneous information. All right, stay safe until the next lecture.